Hello, my name is Utsab Saha. I'm a teacher for Free Code Camp. The goal of this tutorial series is to learn the skills of a senior software developer. In this tutorial, we're going to chat with a senior developer. We'll walk through a specific challenge that he faced and get into the nitty gritty of how he thought about it, what was his thought process. And then we're going to do something new that I haven't done before. We're going to walk through some code that he wrote. One caveat, it did get a little complicated. Don't worry about understanding every single line of code that he wrote. Instead, pay attention to what comes afterwards, the key takeaway or the insight that you can then apply to your own code. Finally, there will be a call to action where I'll explain how you can build something for your portfolio that demonstrates the skills you see in this video. Today we're here with Mike Turitson, who previously worked at Google. And within Google, he worked on the search engine itself, which uh, you can imagine Google might be pretty protective of that code. More recently, he co-founded a company called Workflowy, which is a way of organizing your thoughts, plans, to-do lists. And um, it's pretty cool. Last time I asked, they had around 1 million users. I myself use it for a few things. And this is me, Utsab. So today, Mike is going to talk about a specific skill that he believes separates senior developers from junior developers, and that is the skill of knowing how to organize your code. So uh, that could mean, for example, organizing it so that it's flexible to change in case the requirements of your project change. And it could mean a lot of other things, too. And let's hear how Mike thinks about it. You said flexible to change. I think that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, and, and I guess flexible to change partly means understandable by other people or understandable by yourself three months from now. Um, Cause I would, I would say that that is a big thing I've noticed among less experienced programmers is, is um, the tendency to write code in kind of an ad hoc way where it makes sense like in a particular frame of mind at a particular time. But then even for that developer three months later, I've seen people have a lot of trouble making changes to their own code because it wasn't, it wasn't kind of structured in a way which at a, like maybe each function made sense, but at a more high level, um, there wasn't some sort of overarching thought process regarding the structure and the, uh, of the code and the data structures used and such. So it doesn't, it doesn't have kind of like a logical simplicity to it. Um, and it's hard for anyone else to make changes to or even the same person who wrote it later down the road to me. Okay, great. So Mike, I'm hearing that you have a particular passion for this skill, writing well-designed code that's flexible to change. Yeah, I'm so wondering if we could drill into that a little bit more and I'm wondering if there's a specific example from your history, maybe a, a challenging situation that you've dealt with that could maybe demonstrate how you approached this, uh, this issue of, of how to design your code well. Sure. So, um, I mean, we can talk about this VR side project that I've been having, which is like pretty early stages um, and doesn't do a whole lot yet, but I've definitely had to uh, think a lot about it. I'll, I'll just kind of describe the general idea of it. So I'm partly to kind of like get started on, on doing this development. I'm not sure how um, serious I am about this project in terms of like making it into a real professional thing, but the thing I'm starting out with is a VR music visualizer. So um, I don't know uh, if everyone is familiar with the music visualizer, but like you can see them in like iTunes and this older program called Winamp, uh, where you know you can play your MP3s or whatever kind of audio you have, and um, you'll see often kind of trippy psychedelic uh, visuals that are, you know, will move around in response to like what's going on in the music. Um, so you know, I thought this would be a cool thing to experiment with in VR, where you are kind of inside the visualization instead of just looking at it on your screen. Um, sure. So um, this has been a project which I keep 
it keeps ending up being more complicated than I originally thought it was going to be, which I think is pretty typical of software projects. I think it's especially typical of projects when you're going into a new area where you have, don't have that much experience with. Maybe it would be helpful just to know at a high level what are even the how do you even approach something like this? What's like the overall strategy for building this? Right. So I think I, I like to design things in a top-down way at the beginning. So I think, you know, first of all, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to make gra computer graphics do stuff in response to music. So, I mean, that suggests, I would say, three components at the very least. Those three components being, one, capturing the music. And, and I guess I would say that I wanted to be able to capture the music the operating system is playing. Um, as opposed to making like an MP3 player within my software, um, partly because I wanted to avoid having to write that code, and partly to allow people to like play Spotify or whatever and view and use that audio. Um, so, so that suggests step one: capture the audio. Step two: process the audio for information that can be used to drive a visualization. Um, because without any processing, all you have is this time-ordered list of audio samples, which are just numbers. And all you really know from that is like what the average amplitude of the sound is at a particular time. You don't really have any more interesting information about it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you need to process the audio. And then the third step would be generate graphics based on the processed audio. OK. Um, so those are, those are sort of like the the bare minimum possible things. So I knew I was going to have to do those three things. Um, but then, then I, then I, but then that doesn't necessarily suggest how the code is organized. Um, so for, so, so what I decided to do was I basically have one component that captures the music and, um, and that component is a C++ class, class um, that, uh, it, that class encapsulates a lot of platform specific code and by that I mean Windows operating system code because this is running on Windows um, So that that's one thing I generally try to do is if I'm writing platform specific code I try to isolate it into as small of an area as possible um, Because one one alternative would be to be you know like intermingling the audio capturing code with the audio processing code um, the problem with that being that if if you wanted to port the application to another operating system, you would have a, a much larger chunk of code where you were making changes as opposed to just swapping out the Windows audio capturing class with the Mac audio capturing class. Basically to have all of that code and nothing else in a single module with a generic interface that didn't assume that it was for Windows, right? Um, and, and so that was one decision I made was to decouple the audio capturing from the audio processing code. Okay, we've thrown around a bunch of concepts here. Platform specific code, encapsulation, generic interfaces, decoupling. What do all these things mean? Let's take a look at a quick example. So here I have this function extract audio that's going to read in the audio data in a JSON file here and it's just gonna print out that data. Notice here that the C colon in the file path means that it only works on Windows. This is an example of platform specific code. If I were to run this on my Mac, it wouldn't work. To make this code more portable to other platforms, we'll put all the platform specific code inside of a separate module. Here we have a module, Windows code. Notice that the file path is now stored in a variable called audio location. Now I'll import the module and call it platform specific code and I'll refer to its audio location variable. In this way, the extract audio function no longer needs to know the exact file path. That detail is hidden away inside the module behind this generic variable name called audio location. This process of hiding details about your data inside of a module is called encapsulation. Now, how do we make this code run on a Mac? We can create a new Mac code module and paste in a different file name that's valid on Macs. Then back in our 
extract audio function, we can simply swap in the Mac module for the Windows module. And this will just work because the variable name is the same in both the Windows code and the Mac code. It's, both, it's, it's called audio location in both cases. That's, this is what Mike meant by a generic interface. Notice that we had to change very little code when switching between Mac and Windows. Uh, this, that means we can say that the extract audio function and the platform specific code are decoupled. Okay, so you just saw me walk through a very simple example. Next, we'll start getting into the code that Mike wrote, and we'll start with a high-level overview of how he organized this code. In one second here, I, I want to find a way to draw that somehow. Um, do you have any recommendations? I mean, you could just have two circles, audio capture process or something, I don't know. Okay, audio capture. And the cap, I mean, the capture is like sending information to the processor or something like that with an arrow or whatever. Okay, cool, I like that. And then uh, processing. And then you were saying that, uh, that the platform specific stuff was mainly here in the audio capture land, right? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's, in terms of audio, it's all there. No, there's no platform specific code in the processing section. Right. And okay. that's, that's to make it so in the future, if I want to port this, which I may very really well, well want to do, I can literally swap in a new audio capture class versus if they were, which, which will duplicate virtually zero code with the old audio capture class. Um, whereas if I, uh, if I had them combined, then I would be do either duplicating code or be doing a bunch of, uh, I don't know, it, things would get ugly, basically, if I didn't decouple them and wanted to extend to another platform. So I think that's just a, a general principle I would say is if, if you're doing platform specific code, try to have it in as small of a, have it as small of an area as possible and with no non-platform specific code. So we're about to walk through the code that Mike wrote for his project. One warning about this, it's written in C++, it's complicated, it might be hard to follow. I don't expect anyone to be able to follow along with all the details here. The most important thing, look for the key takeaway at the end of this walkthrough, where I'll explain what are the main principles here that you can apply to code that you write, whether it's C++ or JavaScript or any other language. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to briefly show the classes that I was discussing earlier. So um, we have the first one, which is the audio capturing class. And uh, this, um, so right now it has a very simple interface. Um, so it has, down here in the bottom, it has a bunch of really, um, because one unfortunate thing about C++ is you have to define in your header file all the member variables of the class. So. So, I mean, they're private, so nothing else can actually access them, but it does create this kind of mess of, of indecipherable stuff. Anyway, on the bottom, we have indecipherable Windows-specific stuff. But then on the top, in the public section, we can see there's this constructor, um, which is, it, it basically takes no arguments. You can take one argument to write the captured audio to an output file. And then it has two methods, um, one to get the sampling rate um, of the audio, like, you know, CD quality audio would be 44.1 kilohertz. Um, and then this callback, or, or this function process new frames. So a frame is a collection of audio samples captured from the operating system, and then that takes a callback. And um, I, uh, if I remember correctly, I think I used a callback um, to avoid having to do unnecessary data copying. Um, basically, it's, it's kind of like a a optimization-y type thing, but it's done in a way where it doesn't really add much additional complexity. So basically you call process new frames to get the most recent audio that the operating system is outputting, um, and you give it a callback, which takes uh, a pointer to the, uh, the audio samples and how many of them there are. Um, so uh, you can see that. I'll, I'll just briefly look at the implementation of that just to show how incredibly long-winded and ugly it is. So <laughs> we have like co-create instance, UUID, all this. I mean, basically there's just like pages 
of of like I mean it's kind of crazy how much code needs to be involved just to capture audio. <laughs> anyway, sure. that is why that's in its own classes. So all that stuff is not elsewhere. Um, so then we have, um, so I think, well, briefly there's, I separated, I have the application, which the way I view the application is it's, it's the thing which is actually um, visualizing music. It's not, it's not capturing the audio. It's not processing the audio. It's not like setting up the window, the window. It's not like talking to the VR device. It's just like generating a scene and then rendering it. Um, so, so what is this application class in relation to the two decoupled modules we talked about earlier? So there's a capture and the processor. Where, where does application fit into this? Um, OK, so the application, so if I remember correctly, the application is instantiating the processor. So the application actually owns the, uh, the application owns an audio processor object, which is defined right here. And, um, but, but the, uh, so I, I have another section of code, which is the platform specific non-application code, which is the code, which is like, you know, like capturing keyboard input and on windows and like opening up the window on windows setting like initializing the VR headset so I'm, and also initializing the auto capturing code so basically the the application is getting sent uh, audio frames from the audio capturer using this method I'm highlighting and then it's passing those on to the or sorry to the audio processor which it instantiates um, I could I could have had the audio processor be something which is owned outside of the application module but I decided that I think I basically decided that all I was going to have the application own all non-platform non specific code. All right, so I want to emphasize an important principle that came up in how Mike organized his code. He paid special attention to managing dependencies in his code. So first of all, what is a dependency? A dependency occurs when one piece of your software relies on another piece. Now, in Mike's music visualizer, the music visualization logic depends on audio captured from the operating system, so the app depends on the operating system. Now, Mike, Mike was concerned about the, this dependency, and here is the cue that he noticed that let him know that, hey, there's something dangerous about this. There are two factors. One, how, is, how likely is the dependency to change significantly in the future? And two, how many parts of the code touch this dependency. If both of these numbers are high, this can create problems because then you may find yourself having to rewrite many parts of your code base over time. So in Mike's music visualizer, the operating system could change in a very big way. Let's say he moved from a Windows platform to a Mac. Well, Mac could have a very different way of capturing audio. So it could change in a pretty big way. This number was high. Now, what about number two? How many parts of the code touch this dependency? Well, it turns out that the music visualizer needs to interact with the operating system in a few different ways, and it required a lot of ugly code, as Mike put it. So this number is high, too. OK, so this was concerning to Mike, because if the operating system ever changed, well, he would need to rewrite a bunch of code, Many, every part of his music visualizer logic that interacted with the operating system. So he designed his code in such a way to make it flexible to changing the operating system. Now the solution for this situation that he came up with was, well, uh, since this number is high, let's try to reduce this number and reduce the number, basically reduce the number of parts of his code that interacted with the dependency. And he did this by introducing an audio capture class. Now, all of the operating system interactions are now handled in here. You could say he took all of the operating system logic and isolated them in one place. Meanwhile, the music visualization code only interacts with the audio capture class with this one function, process new frames. This process is called decoupling, or you can say that these two things the music visualizer logic and the operating system dependency are now loosely coupled. 
The advantage of this is this allows Mike to swap in a totally different operating system in the future, and none of this music visualization code, which is the core business logic of his app, would have to change. Okay, I want to address some of the nuances around this topic of dependencies. You saw one example here, how the dependency was concerning to Mike, and so he put that dependency in a small part of the code base and minimized how often other parts of the code touched it. That's definitely a pattern that you can learn from and apply to your own code. But I want to emphasize that dependencies are not always bad. Uh, remember, the key cue here was the dependency changed a lot, and many parts of the code base touched the dependency. Uh, there are other situations, like the dependency might not change a lot. Or it, it could be somewhere in between. And uh, there's, there's a lot of nuances here. So uh, in fact, these nuances were covered in the original case study I did with Mike, but it was just too much information to put in one video. So I'll release another video covering some of those nuances from the original uh, interview I did with Mike. OK, you've seen Mike demonstrate the skill of how he organizes his code. And I've shown you a key takeaway that you can start applying in your own code that you write. Now, I want to make sure that you do actually write some code that demonstrates the skill. I want you all to have a solid portfolio project that you can showcase at your next job interview, in front of your future employer, where you can explain the nuances of why you organize the code the way that you did. One powerful way to build your portfolio is to contribute to an open source project. Now, Free Code Camp happens to be the most starred project on GitHub. It's a respected open source project. And I've put together a guide which will help you get up to speed on the code base and start contributing. You can go over to apprenta.com slash freecodecamp to get that for free. Look down in the description below the video for a link to that. And um, as an extra bonus, if you go through the guide, I'll personally help you find a feature that you can build for Free Code Camp, and I'll help you get started. I'll even give you some pointers on how to think about organizing your code for the feature that you build. All right, now I have another call to action specifically for folks who are from minority groups that are underrepresented in tech, like racial minorities and women. This goes back to the reason that I teach people to code and the reason that I make these videos. I personally enjoy a lot of mentorship growing up and I believe this is the main reason I was able to even have a career as a software developer. I believe that if everyone enjoyed as much mentorship as I did, then everyone could also find their dream tech job just like I did. I believe this so much that I bet my future on this. I left my job as a software developer two years ago to help develop a system of mentorship that won't cost you anything to enter. In fact, you can even get paid as, you, as you're going through the program. You can find out more about this at apprenta.com slash freecodecamp. All right, thanks everyone for watching. Stay tuned for more videos. If you have feedback on what you liked about these videos or what I can do to make them better, please leave comments down below or reach me at utsab at apprenta.com. I got some great feedback from a few of you last time, so please keep doing that.